It's like, uh, there we go. I got some very important business to take care of right before uh, this happens. Uh, I'm doing sneaky cards, and I chose, the, I have to give this card to someone born on this date written below, and since I knew I was coming to Paris, I chose July 14th. So whose birthday was July 14th? Raise your hand. Come down here. You got to come and get the card now. You raise your hand. You have to come and get this card right now. Seriously. Come on. Talk does not happen until you get the card. This is really a great game, usually, and until you call someone out and make them come up and, uh, to the stage and get a card. But usually it's pretty fun. So now your thing is you have to find someone else born on July 14th and give them this card to pass it on. You don't get to keep it. You got to give it away. That's the whole point of the game. There you go. Thank you very much. Let's give it a hand. Okay. So now we can actually start the talk. Um, that's just my warm up right there. It gets way worse from, from there. Um, this is the title of the talk. Uh, notice I changed it uh, halfway through. I, gave the, I started this talk last year, and that's when the Titanic Methodologies was actually the title back then. And the reason why is because last year, there was a lot of fails. There was a lot of people failing, right? And I noticed one thing in the community was a lot of people enjoyed it. A lot of people really enjoyed everybody else having those fails, all those companies having those fails, and loved talking, calling them out on it. And I was like, screw that. I'm going to do a whole talk next year doing nothing but talking about my failures. And I'm not talking about the cool failures where I talk about how, oh, I was working in the laboratory and I uh, figured out this orange and I created penicillin. Oops, that was a mistake. No, or it's not the fails where it's like, oh, I tried a thousand ways to create a light bulb and stuff while I was stealing stuff from Tesla and like, oh, I created the light bulb. Not those kind of failures either. It's just, I failed. Don't do the things that I did. It sucks. So... Hopefully, so hopefully it should be an entertaining talk, right? So, because I've had a lot of creative and entertaining failures. Um, so, the only thing you really need to know about me is I'm really good at failing. It's like, uh, it's like I've, done, uh, I've done trial and error. I don't have any formal education on hardly anything, including, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic. Ask my teachers. Uh, so, it's like I've had to learn a lot of stuff the hard way. It's like I've had to learn how it done just by trial and error. So if I'm good at one thing, and I don't say I'm an expert at anything except for probably failure. It's like if I could turn that into a business, I'd probably be good. At, well, actually, no, I'd probably fail at it because, you know, failure. But, uh, but we're going to go from there. And um, well, I'm going to talk about three different kinds of fails because there's like a, it's a we got a multifaceted kind of fails in this, in this society uh, and in this industry in particular. So I'm going to talk about some blue team fails as, you know, the defensive side some red team fails that I've done as the offensive side, and then also fails that I've done in the community. So let's get right into it. My first fail. Um, I, had st my st I started out a very, 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 very long time ago uh, as physical security and also a supplemental officer for law enforcement uh, in uh, Houston, Texas. And in that situation, when you're dealing with that, you have to understand something. You're meeting every single person that you're encountering and that you're interacting with, you're meeting them on the worst possible day of their life. Because something either horrible has just happened to them and then they get to identify with you showing up and helping out with it, or because you just showed up, something horrible is about to happen to them because you just showed up. So it was, it's very confrontational, it was very adversarial. So when I finally got the chance to get in, this uh, wonderful guy named Tim Smith actually saw me working at a help desk at an online bank and said, hey, do you want to do computer security? And I was like, what? You can do computers and security, but no one shoots at you? <laughs> That's awesome. That's amazing. And so I just like dove right in. It's like he even gave me, he even let me choose my title. I chose Network Security Administrator so I could have the initials NSA. And, uh, and I just started doing my job. And I was patrolling, I was working, I was like, and I made sure people were like, I was doing patrols. I'd make sure everybody had their office badge on. You had to have your, your the policy stated, if you did not have your badge, it's like you had to go to receptions and get a visitor's badge for the whole day. And I was like, and I was, because I was not working with users. It's like I had potential suspects. 
I had possible perpetrators that I had to make sure that they weren't doing anything to my company. And I mean, it literally got to the point where one day I'm doing my patrol around and I, know, I go by the office of the CEO, the owner of the company, and he's typing this way with his back to me. And I go, hey, what's going on? And usually he turns around and talks to me a little bit. And today he was like, hey, how's it going, Jason? He's like, oh, pretty good. And all of a sudden I was like, something didn't seem right. It's like, like, is everything okay? Oh, yeah, everything's fine. And I was like, you don't have your badge, do you? And he was like, no, come with me. And I walked the owner and CEO of the company to the receptionist, and he wore a visitor's badge the whole entire day. Now, that wasn't a kudos for me. That was a kudos to him because he believed in the security policy so much that he was willing to enforce it to himself, making sure that all the people that reported to him enforced it as well. I was just the a-hole that made him go down and get the badge. And that's where I started learning. I was not helping the situation. I wasn't fostering a secure environment. I was, very, I was fostering a very negative environment. I was so determined that all the people that I was gonna be meet were potential suspects or potential adversaries. I didn't try to any, uh, cultivate any relationships. The reason why this picture is so important for this is because I was given this. I don't know if you, do y'all know who Barney Fife is? It's like, it's from a, a TV show in America, and this guy is the bumbling deputy for Andy Griffith, the really nice, cool sheriff. And this guy is the idiot that everybody has to deal with. And this plaque, a plaque like this, was given to me by the executives from the company. And to tell you how terrible I am with social interactions when dealing with actual humans, it took me two years before I realized, oh, that was an insult. They were insulting me, saying that that's who I was. It's like I never figured that out until later. But that's who they saw me as. Not as an asset to the company, not as someone that was trying to help, but this idiot that they had to deal with. That was bad. We need to start understanding that we need to cultivate relationships. We need to understand that your users are not a problem, they're an asset if you properly help with them and engage with them. Uh, I love the Netherlands. These are the Netherlands. Those guys are awesome. They got their own Twitter account where they're like saving kitties and rescuing dogs and like doing, uh, going to parades. And you know why that's so important? Because then maybe, just maybe, wouldn't they have to go on a call that's sort of negative? It's not an automatic negative reaction because they know that they're also doing positive. They also know the positive things that law enforcement is doing for them, so therefore it's not an instant negative association with security or with law enforcement with what the person's doing. Also, if the foster image are being part of the solution, you're not looking for a problem. It's not always looking about who's a problem. It's always not looking about, I'm just trying to get you in trouble because I know you, you're playing solitaire and we told you not solitaire shouldn't be on the machine. It's like you actually have to foster that relationship. You have the power of the employees to get involved with what you do. Tell them about how they can be better protecting the company. Tell them how they can better help out your job. Tell them how they can be part of what you do. One of the things that I do this with is email. It's like, you know, users don't like spam. They don't like uh, uh, phishing emails. So I have a user, uh, (laughs) he's awesome. He's a really good person and I mean that honestly. But he likes to send me spam. I mean, I've got a spam rule for my spam rule for the spam that he sends me. It's so bad. And I mean, I literally got to the point now, it's like, I don't say thank you until like the thousandth new email. And then I'll go say, oh, thank you. That's a new one. Thank you for showing that up. I really appreciate it. It has gotten so bad that he has literally sent me spam from his home email address just so I'd be aware that it's circulating and it might be something I want to watch out for. And I'm like, well, that's a good one. Thank you. Because you know what that happens? What happens when you do that? It fosters that, that, that connection. It's like he goes and he tells his other coworkers, like, I'm, I'm helping out security and stuff. You know, I send, I send one of the security guys that's like emailed, making sure that they know when the phishing emails are coming out. I mean, the first reaction usually is like, wait, we got a security team? That's awesome. You know, it's like it helps get that message out there, what it's supposed to be doing, the positive side of it. So that's what we need to start doing. And that's what I've learned from uh, doing that mistake. So I tried to be a lot less like Barney and more like Andy. Now the next one is this, 
has probably got to be one of the most embarrassing fails I've ever done. So naturally I said, hey, why don't you go tell the world about it? And I'm like, cool, that sounds good. So um, I was working at this uh, one um, company and, so, and I've always had this, you know, I've tried to be good with the users, but I've never really quite understood that that also includes the networking team, you know, cause they're networking, right? It's like, what is networking supposed to do? Networking is like, we gotta make things faster. We gotta get the speed wet up. It's like, you know, just any, any all on the firewall, we're good, we're making it fast. And security's like, no, you gotta slow it down. We gotta do packet inspection, stable inspection. Like, so, so we're always hitting each other, right? So it's always been adversarial and it's always been like a friendly rivalry, well, sort of friendly rivalry, right? It's like, so I would go, I mean, I, it literally got to the point. So if I had to communicate with networking at all, it's like I told my boss what my safe word was and told him if I wasn't back in five minutes to call help. So I had this issue where I was watching the firewall logs. I used to watch the firewall logs like a uh, soap opera. You know, I'm always constantly scanning them, seeing when there's an anomaly, seeing when something's unusual to be de and to detect it. And I noticed that there was these, these uh, drops uh, these, uh, these um, rejections coming from inside the network. It's like from these, uh, from Telnet uh, scan from like some of our internal servers and some of our internal routers. And I freaked the f out because they're inside the building. You know, it's like, you know, that moment of horror. It's like when you realize, oh, wait, they're already in and they're doing something bad. So I totally freaked out. I went over to the networking guy and it's like, I didn't talk to all the other peon guys because who cares about them? I went to the supervisor. It's like, we got this issue. It's like, you know, it's like, I need you to help me look for it. It's like, it looks like they're doing some scans. It's like, and he's like, yeah, it looks like it's originating from our routers. It's like, oh my God, they're coming out from the routers and they're like, bringing to, they've totally destroyed us. It's like, so I've got to like, you know, I've got to respond to this. We've got to create an incident response plan. My boss wasn't there that day, which trust me, he still has lived to regret this. Uh, and so who did I go to? Well, of course, I naturally went, since he wasn't there, I went to the CIO and said, ring the alarm bells, we've got an action, we've got to do this in response. Got to, and we just started going around, it's like for 15 minutes, we're trying to figure out what's going on. And then one of the peon guys in the cubicle raised his hand about 15 minutes after we're already into it. And I mean, I'm talking about like hyperventilating at this point. I mean, Pepsi wasn't even helping me. And it was like, he raised his hand. He's like, wait, did you see, what, what IP address was that? And I'm, I gave it to him. It's like, oh, that could be the telemet scan that I'm doing on our internal router from our Cisco management utility, uh, checking to see if all the machines are running. And I'm like, couldn't you have told me that 15 minutes earlier? It's like, uh, and my CIO, of course, is looking at me like, couldn't you just held down for 15 minutes later? And so it was not a good reaction. It was not a good, uh, let's suppose that I've had better moments at my job than that one. It's like uh, after creating all this chaos and finding that ha what happened. Did it have to happen that way? No. Could they have probably told me what was going on way before? Yes, they're jerks, you know, networking, sorry. No offense to networking people. But, uh, but that's, I, I still have issues, okay? I'm working through them, I'm trying to get better about it, but it's like, you know, I still have issues. And um, why bother? I was a jerk to them. I didn't go over there unless I needed something from them. If I needed to talk to them about uh, uh, a problem with the uh, firewall or I needed something tuned on the IDS, it's like, that I'd give them, it's like, this is what I need, and then buy. So that was the biggest problem. I foster a relationship with users. I didn't put networking in that category as well. I didn't create a channel of communication that is vital when you're doing an incident response. It is vital that you have communication going both ways from all your departments, including networking. And one of the biggest problems was if I would have just had conversations with them before the incident, what would have changed? And you can do that. You can foster those relationships. Because let's face it, there's always a topic you can discuss with them. It's like, I mean, they're fellow geeks, right? So that means they're broadcasting what they like by having the action figures on their desk. You know exactly what they like. I mean, they may be you Star Trek and you're Star Wars, or it's like, but everybody loves Babylon 5. Everybody loves Serenity. So you, you always have common ground. You know, it's like, so you're always going to have um, something that you're going to be interested in. Everybody loved Deadpool or, and, you know, there's always some good movies that you can go and talk about and, and get that kind of foster. Go out to lunch with them. 
It's like, don't make, you, you don't have to pay for it, don't worry. You tell you, I can go, I'll go Dutch. But it's like, it'll, it'll go out to lunch with them, have some conversations, and then that way, when an incident occurs, they know you. They know why you're coming over. They know that it's serious, and they're more willing to help you. And when they're more willing to help you, it helps everybody because you're trying to keep the company secure, and then they start understanding that because they've had conversations with you. So that's what you need to do uh, on, on that side. So let's go to the red teaming side. Now, I really don't like having convicted rapists in my slide decks and stuff, or even alleged rapists unless it's privacy advocacy or IPv6 uh, talks. But I will tell you this thing. It's like, I put this in here because I think this is one of the stupidest slides I see in red team talks. I hate this quote. This is the worst quote and attitude for a red teamer. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Because when I started out, that's what I believed. I believed as a red teamer, because I, I started out in blue team. And so when I started trying to do the red team engagements, I thought that was my job. I got to go around and punch people in the face. I'm going to show them how secure they are. It's like, boom, you have no plan. It's like, I equate it with this. I usually go into an engagement, and my job is to walk into this place and go, hi, I'm here to tell you how ugly your baby is. You know that baby that you've been working with and trying to cultivate and grow up from the very beginning and your whole network? Yeah, it's ugly. It's like, but don't worry. We're going to work together to tell you exactly how ugly this baby is because, whew, it's pretty ugly. So we're going to get it done. And why are you frowning? Why are you not happy? It's like, I'm just here to show you how horrible you're doing. It's like, why is that a problem? It's like, and that's what it was. Red team has got this mentality that they're there to create destruction and sow discord and, and, and capture all the flags and pwn all the boxes. Who the f does that help? As a red teamer, your job is to help the blue team get better at their security. But I come in and I started out with, no, my job is just to go in and pwn things. I got to show them how good I am. It's like, I got very low self-esteem. So it's like, I have to feel like I've constantly got to justify my existence at every moment. It's like, and especially it's 10 times harder when you have to justify yourself to everybody that's actually paying you money to show them that what you're doing is right. So my story of fail on this one is one of the ones that I did, it was one of the ones that I still regret is that I went into this company and I was going in there because I was a red teamer. I'm going in there to destroy boxes and pwn them and show them all the ugly baby pictures they've got on their walls or crap, uh, network diagrams. And I get in there, they have a 10.0.0 network. And when I mean it's flat, we're talking it's flatter than, you know, flat. It's flatter than the flat earth people say that the earth is flat. Okay, it's bad. Their web server, their email server, are on the same network as the HR person and the accounting person and the CEO person. It was all one flat network. There was no DMZ. It was internet and then hallelujah promised land. That's all. <laughs> it gets better. Well, actually it gets tragically worse. Uh, they had a guest Wi-Fi access point, unencrypted, with the name of the company, underscore guest, you're never going to guess what network it was on. Yeah, it was on the no network. I literally get in there within the first 15 or 20 minutes talking to this oblivious networking guy who's, who was actually pretty big of a jerk and stuff, so it's, I wasn't too thrilled with him. Uh, and not because he was networking. He was just individually, he was not a nice person. Um, and I get to him and I tell him, it's like, I can't proceed with this engagement. And he's like, what do you mean? It's like, I can't steal candy from your baby when your baby is giving me the candy. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to try to break into a door that has no, the doorway has no door. There's no locks. There's, there's no, you don't even barely have walls. It's like, I can't really break this. There's nothing for me to break. You've done a really awesome job of, creating rubble and saying that it was functional. I don't need to do anything. So I recommended to the CEO, I mean, literally, I did not take their money. I literally went to the CEO, I was like, look, you need to spend the money that you were going to give me 
and give it to someone that knows how to do network design and how to do that and, or hire a guy who's actually competent at what he does. Um, that was wrong. What could I have done to actually help the situation? That's, I probably will ignore that, but thank you. Um, so uh, they're showing me the time. So what did that benefit? Who did that benefit? That still left him without trying to figure out where it was going on. Part of your job as a red team person is not just to break things, but show them and give them reports and give them ways to make their security better. By me just giving up and saying, well, I can't break stuff, so I'm going home and taking my marbles with me, I didn't help them with their situation. I've had almost an exact identical situation come up recently. And the whole thing I did was I spent over two hours with them talking to them about things that they could implement right away to help detect uh, breach detection, things that they could do and implement that cost no money that could help them understand when an intruder was already in their network because let's face it, there was probably an intruder already in their network. So it's like I showed them those things. I walked them through those things. I tried to give them some help because as a red teamer, that's what you're supposed to do. It's like, um, sorry, I, I, sorry about using the slide again. It's like, but out of a guy who got punched in the face and, and the only plan he had was to bite a guy's ear off, this was actually a pretty good quote. Uh, everybody you fight is not your enemy and everybody that helps you is not your friend. That's actually somewhat coherent. I don't know actually if he actually wrote it, but that's what it's attributed to and I saw it on the internet, so it must be right. Um, so we gotta face the facts that if you're not part of the solution, then you're the problem. You can't always be the problem. Also, allies come in unlikely forms in places. If you go into an engagement as a red team person, and instead of saying, I'm here to show you how ugly your baby is, like, hey, I'm here to work with you and stuff. It's like, I'm here to work in and help you uh, make sure that the baby is okay, the baby's taken care of, and the baby is safe. It's like, which one gets a better response? Which will get you more help? It's like, also, short-term satisfaction often leads to long-term headaches. In other words, when you do that, it's like you get in that and you get to break in and you get to, and I've been in places where it's like, I've totally destroyed them and I annihilated them and I gave them the report. And it's like, and I was a jerk to those people. It's like, because this one guy was like, in this one uh, other instance, this guy was a total jerk and I totally did things to make him miserable because he didn't like me and I didn't like him and it was just not very comfortable. Did I get hired back for that position? Nope. Did I provide them valuable information? Did I help them protect and better secure? Yes. Can every other red teamer do the exact same thing that I did, but with less attitude and less being a jerk? Yes. So they don't need to go to me. So you have to make sure that you're creating and you're fostering relationships. And when you're a red teamer and you're a consultant, that actually matters to your bottom line down the road. So you have to work on that. Now, the other one, this one is funny because this one happened by accident. Usually most of my things are just long-headed stupidity that I've just ingrained in myself that I had to work out of. But this one was actually a revelation that came to me. I was doing this engagement and I was waiting behind, there was this doorway going this way and then there was like a door there and a door here and I'm by this wall and I'm doing my half step. So I don't know if you know the half step, but you gotta do the half step when you're waiting. It, this is very, you gotta practice this because you gotta do a half step so when someone walks through the door, you hear them going through the door, you're already walking in a natural gate. Because it, it subconsciously, your brain, you can understand when someone's stopping and they're walking suddenly. So you gotta have that natural gate already going when the person goes through the door. So I was there, and as I was doing my half step, and I hear them come through, and she starts walking this way through the door, and I'm walking like I'm coming from that door, going through that door. And I look at her, and I use my, my best social engineering uh, voice to go say, hey, how you doing? and uh, walk behind her. She looks at me. She knows I don't belong there. It's like I'm wearing like your company's computer guy shirt. She knows I don't belong there. I'm wearing a visitor's badge that says Gregory D. Evans, Oopsie Inc. on it. Sort of an indicator something bad is about to happen, okay? Right there and then. Um, but she let me in. She went right, I went left. I went to the first office. I'm here to do a Wi-Fi check uh, assessment to make sure your domain policies or your USB rights are working properly. I need you to plug this in real quick. Three machines I compromised, three of them. Boom, boom, boom. I come back out the hallway. She's down the hallway talking to somebody. And I can tell by the way she's looking that she knows she screwed up. She's talking to that person how she screwed up. 
I can go right out that door and go, wee, I won, yay. I punched them in the face. They didn't have a plan. Pay me. But then it came to me. What if I go forward and give them a chance to catch me? What if I give her a chance to do the right thing? I've already technically won. What happens if I give them the win? And that's what I did. I walked past them. I went, hey, how you doing? They looked at me like, mother, I don't, you know, it was not as friendly as the first encounter. And I walk into another office. And guess what? I pwned that office too. I got another one. I had four machines. Less than two minutes later, this huge hulking man comes in. He's like, what are you doing? Hey, what are you supposed to be there? Get away from that computer. And I'm like, oh my God, I instantly regret this decision. Okay. It's like, and I'm like, here, it's like, I'm, it's like here. And I got this in the game. I don't care. I'm going to call this. And I'm like, oh my God. Okay. You know, it's like, but it gave them a win. It showed them what to look up to, what to do right. Then just all the negative things that happened to them. And that's when I changed how I do engagements. I no longer do what's called a red team engagement. I call them security awareness engagements. Those are the only kind that I'll do now, where it's like, I'll go in, I'll break into a place, two, uh, for like two days, I'll be the worst possible thing that ever happened to you at the worst possible time. On the last day, I spend the whole day getting caught, going out of my way to get caught. It's like giving them those wins, because that's what we have to start doing. Giving your target a win doesn't diminish your attack. I still had my uh, malware on their machines. That didn't negate or show that I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do by showing them that they could actually win on it. Servers don't respond to an attack with resentment. People do. It's like, so you got to understand that. I mean, it is hard sometimes to give people win. I understand that. I was at a bank in Beirut in the branch, and literally I'm sitting down behind the bank branch for like over 30 minutes, and I'm sitting in a chair beside the tellers going, why aren't they noticing me? This was one of the ones they were supposed to catch me. Finally, I'm sitting next to a server that's actually doing bank business, and I'm like, tap on the teller, say, excuse me, what's the user ID and password for this machine? He tells me. That was nice. I log in. The user ID and the password were the same, which also happened to be the name of the server that was broadcasted in the lockdown screen, so that helps. So, uh, so I log into it. I do a graceful shutdown of the banking server doing banking business during banking hours, shut it down, I unplug it, pick it up, and I start carrying it out of the door, thinking to myself, maybe they'll catch on to this, you know? And so as I'm walking out, I'm halfway to the gate. I'm like out the, almost out the door. And the teller goes, this looks suspicious. And he stops me and he says, excuse me, what are you doing? And I literally, I'm telling you, I had to shut down the part of my brain that had five different responses that would, I would have promised you would have said, okay, keep going, and would let me go out the door. As I had to shut all those down just so I could say, oh, you got me. You got me. I was, I was a bad guy doing bad things, and you were, you were right on me. You knew something was up. I mean, yeah, you gave me the user ID and password, but you were just checking to see if I was legit and stuff. You were very good. We're going to put your name down on the report to show how, what a great job you did at stopping me. It's like, I know that you guys have great security awareness at this company. Y'all did a great job. I was there for 30 minutes, but that's okay. That's forget. You did great. That was awesome. And he's all like, you know, it's like, and he won. That's what you have to do. You can't just show employees what they're doing bad. You've got to recognize when they're doing good as well. Now, let's talk about some community fails. And this one is one of the, the most interesting and the most irritating one for me, um, especially for this last month, we've had an issue in our community. And it got me to thinking about how I did this talk first. And so my fail is about how I failed when I first started giving this talk. Because at first, I started giving this talk, I didn't mention the person who wronged me in my talk. I didn't want to give him credit. I didn't want to give him his name. And then I realized and I came to understand there's a problem in our community where we have a differentiation between people we don't like and people that have wronged us. There are not a lot, hopefully. I, hopefully there's not. But I know of at least quite a few people who don't like me in this community. They trash talk me. They say horrible things about me behind my back. I'm totally okay with that. I don't particularly like them either. 
I'm not trying to be their friend. I don't want, I've actually told one of the people to their face, I was like, you know, us not like, I like that, let's keep that. You know, that bridge that we burned, let's make the river a little bit wider. I'm good with that, okay? We don't need to worry about the bridge. Let's just make the river wider because I don't need to deal with you. That's okay. Am I gonna mention their names publicly? No. They didn't do anything to wrong me. They just don't like me. There's nothing wrong with that. In this community, there's no prob- there shouldn't be drama because you don't like somebody. But if they wronged you, they have to be outed before they hurt others. They have to be told. My first book, when I gave out uh, my first book, my editor plagiarized his whole section of the book. It cratered my life. It's like, when you look at the horrible things that have happened to me in my life, and trust me, I've had quite a few, what happened to me with that book is higher, ranked higher, than when I had cancer, because it was a worse situation. I preferred cancer over dealing with this guy. His name was Dustin Fritz. He was a horrible person who wronged me, and his name should be known. So he doesn't do that to somebody else. Now, I'm talking about my failures, so I'm going to tell you a failure that I did. I got a book review from a guy who was a local hacker in uh, Oklahoma City, and he was a jerk. He was a total a-hole. He said some really crappy things that I didn't agree with, but he said it to be petty, and he said it to be mean because he didn't like me. And that hurt my feelings. And it happened to be the day that I found that out, that night was a DC uh, DEF CON uh, group meeting that night at, at, uh, at this local meetup. So I get out of my car, and I go up to him, and I just lay the f into him. I will not say anything bad about you that I'm not willing to say uh, behind your back, that I'm not willing to say to your face. So please don't test me, because I will do that. And so I didn't hold anything back. I told him exactly what I thought of him. I told him exactly how I felt about what he said. And it's like, I let him have it. But how did I do that? I did it where there was a whole group of other people standing around. And because to me, I'm not anybody special. I'm Jason. I'm the weird dude and stuff, you know, that hugs people awkwardly and causes problems and wears mini pajamas. That's, I'm not any, I honestly am not that special. And so when I get there, I get into the conversation and that's who I'm, that's who I am. But with him and with the people around him, I was Jason E. Street the guy who spoke at DEF CON, the guy who's written a book, and I eviscerated this guy in front of all his peers and humiliated him. That was wrong. I wronged him. I should have said every single word to him, but not in front of everybody else. I shouldn't have done that publicly. That was my fault, and that was my failure. We've got to understand, just because these people make mistakes, we can't just, I mean, I made that mistake. It doesn't make me a bad person. It's like, you've got to understand, it's got to be brought, sometimes it's got to be brought to their attention that no, that's not cool. You made a mistake, you need to rectify it and go do better. We have to be able to start calling people out for the wrongs that they do and hoping that they actually correct them. Also, never judge someone more harshly than you want to be judged for your, your own failures. Because trust me, it's like for every time you point a finger, there's four more pointing back at you. I always, that's the saying it goes, but I always count. There's only three. There's only three. The thumb doesn't point that way unless you're weird. So it's usually only three fingers pointing back at you, which is still more than that one you pointed at someone else, and I'm digressing, but that's the way it works. You can't just keep casting stones. You have to start helping others and, uh, do better. And also, when you help someone who takes advantage of you, that's not on you. That's on them. I've helped people in this industry, in this community, and it's come back to bite me the out like sh jaws from sharks, you know? It's like, it was bad. Do I regret it? No. Would I do it again? Not with them, because I know they're jerks. But it was at that time, I did it for the right reasons, and that made it okay. I'm not gonna regret it. I'm not gonna kick myself over it. That's the way it works. So the last one, and this is one of my most famous fails. This is like one that I've talked about before, and it's like, and it, it, trust me, it bears repeating because it's like epic uh, in its scale. Um, 
DEFCON 12. My first DEFCON was DEFCON 12. I'm amazed that I actually made it to DEFCON 13 because I was, always, I was always enamored with the DEF CON and the hacking scene. I was like, like I said, I started out in blue team. I started out doing the security. It's like, but I've always been a hacker. I did GUI hacking. I mean, I was like, I remember upgrading Windows 95 with, you know, all the disk and having disk 18 not work right. Mother, I, I remember those things. I remember flashing my 33.6 uh, uh, modem with 56K. I was like, yay, you know? It's like, so I've always been in that, but it's like I never got, knew that there was a community, that there was a family that I could join. And so when I got to DEF CON 12, I lost my effing mind because I had this expectation and I saw all these stories about how DEF CON is. I spray painted my hair blue, wore these really flashy dragon shirts because I'm a hacker. I'm, this is what we do. This is how we go. And, and I'm like, yeah, I have to wash it out and re reapply, but that's okay because I'm a hacker. That's what we do. I was an idiot. I am surprised people still talk to me after that. And some didn't talk to me to around DEFCON 16. It's like, because I was such a jerk. I was going around and taking pictures. I was worse than paparazzi. It's like, you know, hey, FX, let me take a picture with you. Oh, RFID, let me take a picture with you. It's like, oh, so HD Moore, Spoon M, and all those guys released Metasploit DEFCON 12. I've got this awesome selfie that I took with them uh, at a party. Did I learn anything about Metasploit? Did I ask them what they were developing or how they were working on it? Did I get involved in that project? No, I just took a picture. I didn't ask, I didn't talk, I just took pictures. I was an idiot. If you go to conferences and you don't engage and you don't interact, what are you doing here? It's like, it shouldn't be just to hear me talking. Especially me. It's like, that's not going to help anybody. It's like, you've got to be there to engage and interact with the people around you. That's what it's all about. People talk about cosplay. And they talk about the people that are coming in and they're starting out and they don't know what it is. Well, guess what? Why is that bad? Because if you alienate those people that are coming in, spray painting their blue and acting like idiots, you're not going to get anybody better. I'm not that idiot I was before because people took the time to educate me and show me where I was wrong and show me my mistakes so I could be a contributing member of this community. If they would have just written me off right then, there would be nothing else. So yeah, you can have the cosplayers that are playing the, the, the hacker at DEF CON or at these other conferences, but also understand that they can be cult uh, cultivated into being members of this community and, a stronger, and will be stronger for it. So understand that. And one of the key things that I love to uh, do this, especially when we're talking about conference and conference culture, is this last one. Never forget that just like Dennis, you're a valuable part of society and is well known. Because when I go to conferences, there is one word that I honestly, and, and every, mostly every single person has said it in a nice complimentary way. Some have done it just to be insulting, but it's like most of them are complimentary way. And I hate it so much. Rockstar. Jason, you're a rock star. It's like I've been on list and stuff, you know, it's like, you know, the most influential people in security, and it's like, it's like, oh, they're like, oh, well, you've done this. No, I'm not a rock star. I'm a guy who's trying to talk and trying to communicate and try to educate. I'm a dentist on the internet. Because you know why? We're all dentists. What do dentists do? They try to keep people protected. They try to keep their, their mouths and, and their, uh, free of, of germs and hygiene and bad attacks. They try to keep their, they, they have to do, sometimes there's a breach or a cavity and they have to go in and they have to respond to that and they have to fill it in and they have to patch it up and they gotta make it more secured. And sometimes you gotta do a rework on the infrastructure and you gotta have braces. We're dentists. You know the guy, the orthodontist, he's an award-winning orthodontist. He created Invisalign braces. That guy is famous. He is huge. Do you know he goes to other dentist conferences all over the world? And he talks about the, the, the remarkable way that he's created the Invisalign braces. Dentists come up to him. They say, can you sign my book? Can you take pictures with me? This guy's famous because he created this whole new brand of technology to help people that is used around the world by millions of people. Do you know what his name is? I don't either. I forgot what his name was. Even when I was giving this talk, and I knew I was going to talk about him because I don't care. He's a dentist. 
And that's just like we are. Why should everybody else care? Outside of this conference, you're just that guy. The problem is we get into these conferences and these speakers and people like me, sometimes we forget that. And that's not the way it should be. So this is a, my fun part of the talk, which usually means it's gonna be the end because I say now, someone gives someone a mic, who wants to admit what mistake they've made? Who wants to stand up and talk about a mistake that they've done? Any volunteers? All right, well, surprisingly, surprisingly there's usually at least one, so that's, that's always helpful and encouraging. I don't. Exactly. Very good. Thank you. So we actually got one. I don't think we're going to have that many more. So here comes the, the next best part. Oh, I actually have a question. Oh, my gosh. Hello. Yes. Uh, the question is uh, regarding what you said, especially when you were working on the server at the bank. Uh, didn't you ever have any adverse reaction to uh, actually making it easier for you to get noticed? Uh, for example, people considering it uh, condescending maybe or uh, patronizing? Um, I always start the first two days off. Are you talking about like, should I not make it too easy? It's like... Well, if people notice that you actually made it too easy, they might take it, well, kind of bad. Well, no, because I'm a social engineer, so I don't make it that obvious usually. And like I said, the very first two days of the engagement, I destroy them the f up, okay? I'm like, the worst possible thing at the worst possible time, just, I'm bad. People don't like to be around me, because it's like, that's what my job is. It's like, but I always spend that last day creating teachable moments. I create, spend that last day, instead of going into, like, especially in Europe, Europe, I do more of authority, role, authority roles. It's like, you know, it's like in certain areas, I'll do more passive, where it's like, oh, I need help with the door, I'm trying to, can you let me in? But in Europe, it's like, it's very good to do authority roles. It's like, we're here for the si surprise inspection, I need you to let me into the server room. What part of surprise inspection do you not understand? If you knew about it, you would already have had this door open, I wouldn't have been waiting here for five minutes. Open the door, you're on the report. And that's my going in. Versus when I'm trying to get caught, it's like, um, I'm supposed to get into the, uh, the server room and doing the inspection. It's, uh, what, the, the supervisor, uh, John, he knows, it's like, I'm supposed to be here, so can you let me in? It's like, I need help getting in. It's, uh, that's, because it's, it's on there, I've got the email right here, you should let me in on it. Uh, so there's a difference. It's like, so usually that's enough to go, okay, no, I'm not letting you in. That's actually happened before, and it's like, I'm like dude, you're really bad. It's like, uh, but overall, they usually catch me on that. So, um, so you, you don't make it obvious. It's like, I mean, literally, with the, the bank, uh, uh, that bank branch was literally the very bottom of the, the chart right here when it comes to security awareness. So uh, I had to do something a little bit above and beyond. So that's, that's where that worked out. Any other questions? And by the way, I was trolling y'all through the whole presentation. There was, a, there was a, several Easter eggs of fails in my talk. Uh, you, if you want, you can go back and play it again at home and figure out which ones they were. But the obvious one was, yes, I was using Comic Sans through the, the whole presentation. Thank you once again. <laughs>